So Jingyi Yu is a professor at the university, um, uh, the Shanghai Tech University, and um, he's like done a lot of like interesting work in computer graphics, computer vision, um, especially on computational photography and non-conventional optics and camera designs. Um, today, I think he's going to talk to us talk to us about uh, some recent work on uh, neural rendering of uh, human bodies. Thanks very much for inviting me. It's my great pleasure to give a talk on our latest work on uh, digital human modeling using uh, neural modeling and rendering approaches. So um, we all know that actually digital human uh, have been broadly used in a wide range of applications, ranging from uh, movies to gaming to latest AR and VR applications, as, as well as uh, sports training. So uh, as an example, actually, during uh, my own quarantine, actually, I used, uh, you know, tissue human uh, for personal fitness training a lot. So we actually captured, you know, uh, a series of uh, movements of a trainer and along with uh, our inferred uh, muscle and the skeleton structures and uh, to actually put it into an AR setting. For example, can uh, we can actually see you know position the person on a, a desktop, and uh, we can actually see the movement very clearly along with the muscle movement. So uh, I'll very quickly jump into traditional approaches, then uh, our neural approaches. So for traditional approaches, we all know the probably the most widely used the uh, 3D reconstruction scheme or passive 3D reconstruction scheme is a uh, structure from motion. Uh, the seminal work uh, by uh, Algua et al. Uh, use the you know uh, on, on internet images and they try to reconstruct a uh, high quality uh, large scale scenes, and uh, uh, they unanimously follow the same uh, uh, procedure. For example, uh, conduct a camera pose estimation, which is very well studied these days. Then uh, conduct a, a triangulation to form a uh, point cloud, and uh, later on do the triangulation of the point cloud and then texture mapping. So. Almost, uh, you know, all uh, widely used uh, digital human reconstruction schemes use uh, uh, SFM type of structures. Uh, one example is uh, a dome system we built at uh, Shanghai Tech. Actually, uh, starting from 2016, we, uh, we started building this uh, very large dome system uh, composed of over 80 uh, live cameras uh, at, uh, you know, uh, 2K resolutions. And these days we upgrade the camera to 4K. Uh, these systems are expensive, no doubt, and uh, complex. Uh, there are several tricks, you know. First of all, for example, you know, the camera's uh, uh, viewpoint or view volume is uh, rather limited. So it's kind of tricky to determine, you know, whether each camera should view the whole body or just part of the body for better reconstruction. There are always, uh, you know, design issues and tricks. As an example, you know, we worked with the, the, uh, the Juilliard uh, uh, School in, in, in New York City. Actually, we captured, you know, uh, performers. Here we show a drummer, you know, a violinist, a singer. And uh, you can see actually the initial reconstruction uh, actually look just okay, I would say. Because you see all kinds of uh, visual artifacts caused by uh, your lack of textures, caused by heavy occlusion, etc., etc. So, uh, this is actually very common in uh, structure from motion type of solutions. You know, for example, in order to conduct a reliable triangulation, you need to first establish uh, robust uh, correspondence matching, and then later on, you know, optimization and triangulation can be tricky and time-consuming. And I'd like to point out one uh, interesting phenomena, you know, discussed by uh, Takeo Kanade. Uh, he called uh, uh, more cameras can be worse. <laughs> Basically, what it means is that if you use more cameras, conceptually, they're supposed to be better. But because of, you know, misalignments uh, of cameras or, you know, uh, uh, errors in uh, uh, calibration, you will observe fine details such as uh, fingers, hair, nose, all the fine details will be missed during reconstruction. The more cameras you use, you know, so it's very counterintuitive, but actually we all do observe it in real life. So how do we do that? So my talk is composed of uh, four components. You know, first we talk about how to do high quality human body reconstruction, then switch to face, then to uh, hands and finger, and essentially to hair. So let's talk about the, the uh, 3D human body reconstruction first. So. Uh, a few years ago, we started like revisit the problem, and we observed that maybe we are on the wrong track of just 
merely improving the reconstruction quality. Because as mentioned, you know, uh, despite you know advances in, in cameras and uh, uh, algorithms, essentially robust 3D reconstruction is remains still very challenging. In fact, we uh, use the commercial software Capture Reality for comparison. We observe, you know, whenever there are, you know, uh, textureless regions, heavy occlusions, they also fail uh, very badly and requires tremendous artists' uh, efforts to fix these. So, how about we try to learn to fix the errors, you know, in uh, in the uh, reconstruction, which we call neural human rendering, which was published two years ago. So the main idea is as follows. If we are, are able to re recover a low quality 3D point cloud, and we know the camera parameters, maybe we can, you know, uh, leverage neural rendering to fix specific views or, you know, also, uh, for example, masks. And uh, then we can actually generate a better rendering and a better reconstruction. So to uh, elaborate on this uh, uh, type of approaches, essentially, uh, we use a point at plus plus to extract a 3D features from our low quality point cloud. And uh, then we feed it into a neural renderer. Uh, essentially, it produces two things, a feature map and a depth map. And then we use a UNet, you know, to basically, we all know UNet are very good at uh, kind of like a denoising super resolution type of uh, tasks. So we use a UNet to patch the uh, errors or holes, you know, in the, uh, in the uh, mask, as well as uh, fixing reconstruction. So the idea is very simple. Essentially, you start from a poor reconstruction, then you, you know, slowly move to better and better masks and uh, images. And uh, uh, it turns out to work very uh, well in the sense that if we are able to generate very dense masks at a very high quality, we can further conduct, uh, for example, shape from silhouette or volume carving to actually patch uh, the errors or holes or noise, you know, uh, in the initial reconstruction. So this is our first attempt. For example, you know, um, the uh, trainer actually wears a, a black short. So uh, essentially the back shorts you know, they impose uh, tremendous problems in traditional reconstruction. By using this kind of mask generation, and then we use a mask to fix the, uh, the holes, they will produce much better results. So let me, here I show you the comparisons. On the right, you see the initial reconstruction uh, using, for example, Comap or uh, Capture Reality or uh, any structure from motion algorithms. And on the left, we show the reconstruction uh, uh, using our techniques. Uh, I'd like to point out a few parts, for example, the nose, you know. So uh, as mentioned, the more cameras you use, you know, due to errors in calibration, uh, fine geometry will be lost, for example, the nose here. But using our approach, you know, you can recover very high quality fine geometry. And the other part is the black shorts. So with, uh, uh, without using our technique, you know, Traditional methods will uh, exhibit the holes, but in our case, we managed to fix up these holes. So this is our initial approach. So uh, along the line, you know, we were thinking, okay, maybe we can, you know, extend the work to mobile portrait scanning. So we started working uh, on this project with the Oppo, you know, the uh, cell phone manufacturer, and they wanted us to use a cell phone to capture multi-view images of a, of, a, of a person, and then uh, using SFM type of structure to recover that. So here we show the initial reconstruction using uh, our techniques, you know. Uh, they also have a lot of other requirements, for example, real-time performance, things like that. So they're all very challenging. So our thoughts is that to uh, exactly reuse this uh, neural human rendering pipeline to uh, address uh, this problem. Specifically, you know, we reuse this uh, NHR type of work. Uh, then we use a UNet to simultaneously to fix the both appearance and the geometry. And uh, uh, the results actually looks uh, pretty reasonable, even with a very sparse set of uh, input RGB images. So here uh, I show you, you know, uh, some of the sample results, you know. Uh, so you can see actually, uh, to some extent, it even exhibits, you know, view dependent uh, features. Uh, which is actually common in, uh, for example, latest uh, NERF settings, right? So this also shows because we use, a, a, you know, a nearby views, you know, to conduct a view interpolation. So it also preserves the view dependency uh, effects. So, uh, so basically we have this uh, setting using, you know, uh, multiple cameras, structure from motion as raw inputs, fixing the, both the mask and the geometry using deep network type of uh, solutions. So we want to extend it a little bit further. So the first uh, trial 
uh, we conducted is uh, to use just uh, six RGBD cameras, you know. So people use that for, for example, dynamic fusion type of uh, uh, results. Uh, in our case, we basically uh, use uh, uh, six RGBD cameras. And uh, uh, one thing we I want to point out to kind of different from uh, other approaches is that we also have a texture branch. So we figured that, you know, uh, it'd be very interesting to combine, uh, you know, geometry fixing with a neural texture blending actually to simultaneously recover geometry and the texture. So this is uh, using six RGBD cameras. And uh, here we call that a few shot neural human rendering. And you see you know, on the left, it's a very sparse point cloud of the Spider-Man. On the right is uh, the results you know, using uh, our neural renderer. So again, you know, the multi-view or FVV type of rendering produces a very high quality uh, results you know, and it, fix, it partially fixes the geometry. And uh, here I'll show you more uh, results, you know, again, you know, here we only use uh, uh, six cameras and uh, uh, even we can handle, you know, for example, uh, 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 very complex clothing, uh, black uh, uh, textures, you know, uh, all these kind of tricky, tricky cases, you know, we can partially uh, handle the, uh, all these problems. And so this basically gives a hope, you know, maybe, you know, we can fix the geometry using new rendering. So uh, we further extended it to, for example, only using RGB cameras. So in this setting, we use uh, six RGB cameras. Here we use the Connect. The D is essentially used for verification and uh, basically uh, to verify whether our results are of uh, reasonable quality. So uh, you can see actually uh, the person, everything is rendered in real time. So you can uh, actually uh, uh, use the neural rendering engine actually uh, try to contact uh, multi-view shape reconstruction and uh, FVV rendering in real time. Uh, even you know can handle uh, complex topology uh, changes. You know, for example, taking off clothes, etc., etc. All right. So this was uh, published at the uh, last uh, this year's CVPI. All right. So uh, the main idea is uh, once again is like follows. You know, you want to use a sparse capture system, uh, so mitigate the the cost problem. And uh, then you use a uh, uh, learned uh, geometry because you don't have RGBD, right? You only have RGB, so you want to use the neural geometry. But we find uh, what's more important is also neural texture blending. So you want to have a way to blend the textures so that it looks very good, you know, when we change a viewpoint. Okay. So this is trying to show you, you know, you can even handle complex, you know, human object interactions. In this case, you know, the person. Uh, its geometry is recovered by the six RGB cameras, and uh, you can even recover, for example, the, the bags, uh, and the person you know taking on all the bags. All right, so uh, we conducted one more step further. How can we actually only use one RGB cameras, right? So this is uh, turns out to be very difficult. One RGB camera essentially falls into the category of you know simple type of uh, like a reconstruction, right? So we figure that the most challenging part is not the geometry, but actually pose. So to that end, you know, we build a uh, our multi-view capture system that consists of uh, both the mocap system by count and also the uh, multi-view reconstruction solutions. And we use that uh, to capture, you know, very complex movements. You know, uh, these include people doing, you know, very athletic movements or uh, doing yoga type of things. You know, here we show some of the challenge motion data sets, you know, some are really challenging, you know, for example, doing push-ups, you know, um, and then doing, you know, app works, all these are very challenging movements. And uh, use that as training data because we have both the 3D geometry and the uh, ground truth, uh, you know, uh, 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 motion capture data. So we can actually train uh, 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 a network to actually handle, tackle all these challenging problems, you know? So, Basically, we captured the 60, by far, you know, we probably already exceeded 100 uh, uh, challenging movements and also 10 performers. And uh, I show you some of the interesting results, you know. The, the first one I show you is uh, for the person doing a push-up. This is uh, challenging, you know, because uh, a lot of uh, views are occluded. And you see, our results are not perfect yet. For example, the left arm, you know, still exhibited some, you know, jittering and uh, instability. But still, you know, it shows that it can actually fit very well. So another uh, challenge uh, we faced is that uh, can we actually directly handle um, challenging movements in sports videos? 
this turns out to be very uh, useful in the uh, in sports uh, uh, analysis. For example, we managed to actually uh, show here's I uh, show you some of the results. You know, doing badminton. I think the key here is essentially we managed to capture all these uh, movements, ground truth movements, as well as uh, multi view uh, movements. You know, so this we helped a lot, uh, including for example diving. You know. We handle uh, our blurs, occlusions, complex poses, etc. Uh, we also introduced the you know semantic meanings of these movements. We turned out we find it very useful as well. Right? Yeah. So this is the first uh, uh, you know theme of uh, uh, of work you we've been doing on high quality three D reconstruction human body parts. Um, I think one of the most interesting part of human is uh, human faces. So we started looking at the human face reconstruction more than you know five years ago you know so uh, our goal is actually trying to use for example existing high quality 3d data to train uh, a network that can actually predict uh, fine geometric details uh, from a single image you know so this is showing our uh, iccb 2019 work basically we introduced a, a emotion based uh, you know proxy geometry estimation scheme takes into account you know the emotion uh, of the facial expression and uh, we also introduced a detail layer uh, recovery network you know trying to recover fine details so uh, here's the, a little bit more details about that the essential idea is uh, actually decompose the image into patches and they use the patches to infer you know uh, 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 fine geometry within each patch and uh, for training purpose you know we introduced the two training schemes uh, one is uh, supervised the other is unsupervised the supervised essentially is our own data plus the USC light stage data, which uh, consists of very high quality 3D geometry uh, of the human faces. The unsupervised training uh, plays also a very important role because we only have very limited number of uh, training uh, data, you know. So we have to use online images without geometry for training. So let me go a little bit deep into the details of our solution. So first of all, we build a, uh, our own, you know, uh, photometric, high quality photometric system, which can capture very high resolution facial details, you know, for example, you know, the wrinkles, the pores, you know, uh, all, all the facial structures can be uh, cap captured very accurately. We also leverage, you know, uh, USC's ICT data structure. And uh, uh, for supervised training, as I mentioned, uh, essentially, you know, we uh, decompose the image into patches and uh, uh, basically try to use a PCA type of, you know, scheme, try to predict uh, whether, you know, uh, the basis uh, of, the, uh, uh, of the patches to, for the fine geometry inference. So um, this is a more interesting because all the previous ones I've shown you is uh, actually uh, are static, you know, facial images. So it took us almost four full years, you know, to build our own, you know, dynamic light stage. So we call that live field stage, mainly because it's not only a multi-light source capture, but also a multi-view capture. So uh, the system, you know, composes of uh, up to a thousand uh, light sources and uh, 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 about, you know, 40 cameras, you know, trying to capture the dynamic facial expression. Here's uh, how the system works in, in lifetime. So here we use the Flex 4K, you know, ultra high speed camera with a 4K resolution at the 4K frame per second. So this allows we can illuminate uh, the subject at a very high frequency without, you know, the subject experiencing bad feelings. And uh, this is showing you, you know, our camera resolution is so high, you can actually capture very, very fine facial details. So, for example, you can capture, you know, ultra fine details such as the pores of the face. You know. And we can also do relighting type of application, which I will talk about in a second. Right. But what I'm saying is that essentially we managed to build our own, you know, light stage data for uh, conduct the supervised training. But we also conducted unsupervised uh, training because we uh, collected uh, over 100k in, in a wild images. 
The main idea here is actually to first estimate the lighting and albedo of these facial images, right? Then essentially we use our network to predict the fine geometry of the facial structure and the re-render it. So it's a differentiable rendering, you know, pipeline. Basically try to match the appearance loss. So turns out to boost the performance significantly with uh, the uh, unsupervised uh, training. So let's look at some of the uh, unsupervised training results. Essentially, you know, we have the uh, coarse mesh, normal map, shading map, albedo, you know, all recovered, you know, using the single image. Once we do that, you know, we feed into uh, our differentiable renderer and then trying to recover the fine geometric details. So with the help of supervised and unsupervised training, we can conduct some very cool tasks. One task is, uh, for example, this is the late uh, actor Robin Williams, and uh, using our technique, we can actually recover, for example, you know, wrinkles uh, on the forehead, you know, essentially all the fine facial details. We also match the expression of the face and the mood of the face, which we find very important. And uh, uh, here is my favorite result, you know, uh, neither uh, subjects can be actually uh, uh, captured using our technique, right, apparently. So on the left, uh, President Donald Trump, on the right, you know, Jack Ma from Alibaba. And uh, uh, we managed to use our technique to infer very high resolution and uh, uh, detailed uh, uh, facial geometry using uh, this framework. All right, so once we conducted this task, we started looking at, okay, maybe we can do one more step you know all previous ones you know, are using one single image right can we actually using a single image but at the same time change the style of the image but in this case not in the 2d style but in the 3d style so uh, my student Anpei Chen you know who will be doing a postdoc uh, with uh, Andre will actually has been actually doing this work so his idea is actually to introduce something called a 3D semantic uh, volume or field. It's called uh, SOF, semantic occupancy field. And uh, the difference between this technique and traditional approaches is that this is really embedded in 3D. So if you revisited it from the nerves perspective, right, you can see actually it does fit the volumetric kind of uh, reconstruction ideas. So the main idea is, you know, using the SOF as primitives and uh, combine it with uh, our 3D scanner models. And uh, then you, we can change styles and change viewpoints on the, on the fly. So here's my favorite uh, demo. And this is uh, showing you uh, generating uh, from drawings. So in this uh, specific case, you know, uh, let's say if someone wants to, uh, uh, you know, generate a face, you know, uh, looks like Harry Potter, Daniel Radcliffe, right? So what we can do is actually we can find a photograph of uh, 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 Daniel Radcliffe. Then a artist or user can actually, you know, paint on top of the uh, uh, images, you know, draw eyebrows, draw hair, draw nose. As the artist started drawing different parts of the facial uh, structures, uh, on the right, you know, it will automatically generate this kind of uh, 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 images and of course you can change viewpoints later because it does support the multi-view type of a viewing experience so as you can see you know this is interesting because we're drawing along the you know the by bi not bi binoculars you know are, are round but the generated ones are, are, are rectangular so as we generated the uh, the mouse you know the facial expression will appear accordingly right so uh, I'd like to point out one more thing on what we did on facial uh, reconstruction, that is uh, relighting. Because, you know, our uh, fine geometry of the faces are generated using uh, our light stage. So we naturally, you know, have our own, you know, dynamic uh, light stage uh, data. So we have, this, uh, new, we have this neural relighting framework. Basically, you know, we can conduct image-based relighting uh, because we have both geometry inference and environment map and the, the lighting latent code. So we implement this on the cell phone, which we are pretty proud of because we checked, you know, by far probably only like a Google uh, Pixel 5, you know, they have a, a you, know, equi you know, equally uh, 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 high quality uh, relighting schemes. So this is showing you that we can actually capture image on our cell phone. Then we can change environment lighting. We can even add uh, more light sources to, uh, you know, uh, uh, change the illumination uh, effects. All right, this is showing you we can actually do 
live videos, you know, not only on images, but live videos. This has been accepted to ICCB 2021. So this is showing you on the top is the original input image. On the bottom, uh, uh, we show two, you know, relit uh, uh, sequences using different environment uh, uh, maps. So I'm showing you kind of like using this technique can actually boost uh, uh, the capability of relighting. I do want to show uh, you this limitation because if you look very closely to the images we produce, um, you will see actually uh, still it loses a high frequency components like facial details. So we're in the process of uh, fixing these kind of uh, facial uh, details uh, using, uh, for example, something like uh, around the total relighting uh, work. So uh, I talked about two parts already. One is uh, on the human body. Hopefully I've shown you that, you know, the deep net are pretty good at, you know, fixing holes, fixing noise, you know, and also generating a uh, new appearance, right? So the face is more like a generating fine details, generating, uh, you know, uh, appearance models. In the human body case, you know, it's more like fixing. So these are two very unique capabilities. So let's move on to the other part is very difficult, that's human hands. So uh, there has been a lot of work, you know, on, you know, generating, you know, human body movements, but in contrast, a very limited work on hand movement. Probably the most, uh, you know, uh, 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 famous work is uh, the Mano framework, you know, uh, by Romero et al. And uh, uh, still, you know, I think the fundamental reason behind the hands, why the hands are so difficult to uh, recover, is first of all, we do observe hands every day, right? So we know, okay, this movement is fake, this movement is real. The second is we lack an anatomical understanding of, on how our hands move, on how our bones move. C can you even tell, you know, which joints are moving under a specific pose? So we did a, a crazy task, which I view, you know, which is a uh, is pretty insane. <laughs> that is, you know, we generated a the first MRI uh, hand data structure. So uh, our goal essentially is try to understand the anatomical uh, structure of hands, you know, the bones, the ligaments, and the muscles. So uh, we made some achievements on the bones, and we're in the process of, uh, 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 you know, understanding the muscles and ligaments. So uh, let's talk about, you know, the goal here. The goal essentially is try to build an anatomically correct and simple to animate and the differentiable hands. So essentially, we want to use MRI to, uh, to do that. We are very lucky, actually. We at Shanghai Tech have a MRI machine that hasn't been used by anyone. It's just sitting there. So I said, fine, you know, why don't we just uh, use uh, that MRI machine to capture? So there are existing MRI or CT data sets, but very limited. For example, the uh, TOG 2019 paper, there were 24 MRI scans with only two subjects, very small scale. So in contrast, you know, we want to generate a much larger data set. Okay? So essentially we, what we managed to do is we actually capture the 200 MRI scans and uh, of 35 subjects and uh, 58 postures. And uh, don't make me wrong, this, is, uh, this task is extremely painful because each subject actually needs to stay still for four, 40 minutes per posture. So this is a very painful experience, you know, but in the end, we managed to get this uh, very valuable data. So in order to do that, because when you capture, when you stay there for just even five, 10 minutes, you know, your hands movement will start to change. So, uh, so what we did is we use a, you know, a, a molding solution, you know, trying to build a mold of the hand, right? So your hand will stay fixed. And on the right, it shows that using the MRI data, we managed to capture the very accurate bone structures, you know, on top of the uh, appearance structure. This is showing you some of the results. This is showing you our MRI volume on the left, and on the right is the MRI slice. And the ways we have the MRI volume, we managed to use a segmentation, apply a segmentation scheme to segment the, the very fine bone structures. To our knowledge, it's probably the first, you know, comprehensive MRI hand structure produced ever, you know. So we're in the process of uh, releasing part of the data to the public, you know, but probably not all yet. But we are, at the same time, we are capturing, you know, and annotating, for example, muscle structures. So uh, in our results, you know, uh, we basically 
uh, use uh, you know around the 3,000 vertices, 6,000 faces, and 20 bones and 19 joints. And uh, uh, this turns out to uh, work out very well. So I'm not going to talk about details, but basically we use a, a LBS to uh, consider you know, both the shape parameters and the pose parameters together. And uh, using that, our goal is actually in trying to uh, combine the appearance with uh, the MRI bone structures. If we manage to capture a single view or multi view of the hand, can we actually infer the bone rotation and the joint positions you know, uh, 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 from the images? So this is, uh, this is our you know, pose estimator. So, uh, due to time limit, I'm not going to talk about details, but this is just showing you some cool results, you know, just using a single RGB or multiple RGB uh, images, you know, we can actually refer uh, very accurate the bone position and structures. This was uh, published at the Ichikai 2021. All right. So uh, our next step is actually trying to use uh, uh, integrate it with uh, muscle structures. So the last part, also I think is a very promising part, is human hair. It's actually hair. So the hair is uh, very difficult to recover, but never underestimate you know, the uh, realism of a hair. The hair is very important because if the realism of hair is lacking, then even though you can recover hands, face, body very accurately, everything would look fake with the hair. So we introduced something called the neural opacity point cloud. The main idea is, again, going towards the volumetric type of our concepts, you know. We want to introduce the opacity value on top of the RGB value. So we adopted the, uh, 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 you know, the multi-view setting uh, capture, you know, just like the human body. But in this specific case, we want to infer not only the RGB color, but also the alpha value of it. So uh, the pipeline goes uh, uh, pretty much uh, like the NHR neural human rendering, as I talked in the very first place. You know, so you infer the point features from the feature map. You use uh, separate branches to handle the RGB color and alpha uh, branch to handle the alpha volume. And uh, uh, this fits very well into the traditional differentiable uh, renderer, you know, uh, pipeline. And uh, you can actually conduct, you know, uh, differentiable rendering back and forth to, uh, you know, optimize the volumetric alpha map. And uh, it turns out, you know, in our case, you know, this works out uh, very well. So uh, I'd like to mention that we do use a separate, you know, uh, decoder to handle the uh, alpha channel during rendering because your training and rendering are done separately. So this is showing you, you know, if we do a rendering without uh, using a separate uh, path, you know, the render the result will exhibit uh, excessive blur. But if we do use a separate uh, alpha encoder decoder, you know, the volumetric uh, uh, alpha will uh, exhibit a sharpness and uh, much clearer. Okay, so uh, I'm going to skip to the training part due to time limits. Um, instead, I'm trying to show you this uh, our capture system. Again, our capture system uses uses uh, this multi view capture, but in this specific case, we only use a uh, static uh, cameras, SR cameras, and uh, using multi view capture system, we can actually uh, build uh, this uh, point cloud, and uh, then you know uh, we get a ground truth alpha mat for each captured views, and uh, then use the capture views to conduct training and. Um, eventually, you know, volumetric uh, alpha rendering. So I want to show you the results. Details can be found in our PAMI paper. So on the left is showing, you know, uh, traditional uh, image-based uh, opacity, how you see the jumping of uh, uh, appearance. If you use a uh, neural rendering without considering, you know, separating channels, you know, you see this uh, weird blending effects, but this is using our results and no PC results. You can see the hair structure can be Alpha map can be very well preserved. This is showing you, you know, um, uh, a wolf thing, you know, and uh, with the uh, 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 geometry only, you know, you see jumping with uh, uh, without separating the alpha channel and the RGB channel exhibits excessive blur. With NLPC, you know, it shows you, you know, stability and you see the very nice uh, structure uh, of the fur. This is showing you a real result of a uh, human hair. You see the jumping in the uh, traditional IDR, excessive blur uh, without con separately considering the uh, alpha channel. This is showing our results. So uh, 
we are we're also motivated to see the possibility of integrating this uh, with uh, for example uh, a neural uh, radiance field the nerve and because the nerve naturally provides a, a volumetric reconstruction so this will fit perfectly into the alpha channel so I'm only going to show you the results, you know, with the, the nerve type of, you know, volumetric uh, uh, alpha. You will see, actually, we can even achieve one order of magnitude, more magnitude uh, higher quality alpha reconstruction. So this is showing you the real hair. And you can see, you know, all the fine details, you know, are preserved uh, using, uh, op using the volumetric opacity we inferred from a nerve. Okay, so uh, I think my time is up, you know, uh, I'd like to thank my team at the Shanghai Tech, you know, without whom, you know, we wouldn't have accomplished all these tasks. So uh, we have a slogan, to see is to believe, to believe is to see, and uh, multiple members of uh, my groups are graduating, some uh, will join, you know, uh, Tina's group, the other will join actually Andre's group. So uh, they're all looking for postdocs. I think they're doing very well. So if you have postdoc or even faculty positions, please do consider them. If you have students who want to send over to Shanghai Tech, you know, to work with us, you know, we have a, a live stage. Actually, we have a two live stages, one smaller one, one bigger one. And then we, we have a, a dome system with 80 cameras. So we're very pleased to work with you all. Uh, I think that uh, concludes my talk. Uh, thank you all very much. Thank you very much uh, for Jingyi. I think Jingyi is here today um, with oh, us. Oh, hi, yes. Yeah, sorry. Uh, hi. Sorry. I, I was hoping to give the talk in person, but it turns out, you know, my network is unstable, but for q and I think it's okay. But uh, essentially, you know, uh, I think, you know, everything is delivered in the pre-recorded video. That, that's awesome. Um, the video is like, uh, is, is amazing with the tons of like crazy, um, interesting work. Um, like I have a quick question. Um, we'll probably have a few more from the chat. So um, how do you see this approach for capturing um, like 3D shapes? For example, the wolves, um, if you want, if we want to, you know, uh, train a model for a wolf, um, how much effort do we actually need to um, spend on capturing the uh, 3D data? Uh, this is a really good question. So uh, I'll share with you my uh, own experience or the experience from my group. So uh, we figured actually, you know, uh, Nerf, you know, is a really, really good uh, on, uh, on rendering new views. If you want to render like a, a new views, you know, uh, even with the opacity or volumetric opacity, Nerf works really, really well. Uh, the challenge, though, is actually how do you use a nerve kind of settings, you know, to uh, actually do the reconstruction because it's a slightly different problem, right? Because essentially you're targeting at, you know, converting volumetric structures, right, to surfaces. Uh, there are several recent, very magnificent recent works, right? For example, news, I think, you know, um, which is really cool using a uh, sign distance field, you know, we see very promising results as well. Uh, for the wolf thing per se, the challenge is not the shape. The challenge is uh, is uh, is the fur is is the volumetric one. So uh, uh, our focus is currently is mainly on reproducing uh, photorealism, photorealistic alpha math, you know, at the different viewpoints rather than just reconstructing them. But I see actually, you know, I think the whole community is going towards a neural reconstruction route. So I think we'll see a lot of uh, uh, exciting work coming out. Awesome, great, thank you. Um, so I think there is a question from the chat, um, which mm -hmm. says um, mm -hmm. NH, N N NHR, I guess it's neural- uh -huh. uh, uh, human Right, rec human rendering, rendering. Uh, right. Reconstruct. Right. Yes, uses differentiable rendering to complete uh, sparse mm -hmm. geometry. Can it be extended to nerve or news um, architectures? Uh, this is a really uh, interesting question, actually. So for the uh, for the NHR, we use the point cloud from uh, structure from motion because at that time there was no nerve, <laughs> so so we couldn't use nerve, you know. But but you're right. So we can definitely use a, a, a ge geometry, you know, from a nerve as a starting point, and then conduct NHR. Uh, having said that, I think there are alternative routes than using NHR because like there are so many. Uh, nerf related works, you know, coming out these days. Uh, one possibility is to combine with uh, uh, IVR nets. So for IVR nets, you know, it will accelerate the training significantly. You pre-train a network and then, you know, uh, use, uh, you know, sparse images to refine the results. 
Uh, and so basically, we we actually have a paper at uh, uh, ACM Multimedia this year. Just uh, you know, the conference will be in a few weeks. An oral paper um, using IBR Net for uh, sparse uh, multi-view human reconstruction. So I think you know definitely, yeah, NERF can be used to, to combine with NHR, but uh, alternative routes are because you want to accelerate nerve training. So you definitely, you know, uh, IBRNet is a very plausible route. Great, um, thank you very much. I think we're running out of time. Uh, we'll okay. probably have a very short uh, break. Uh, thank you, Jingyi, uh, for joining us today. Um, thank you, yeah. I'll see you at the panel though, okay. <laughs>